Take two. Okay. My name is Annika Lucas. My name is Annika Lucas. I'm My name is Annika Lucas. I am the founder of an organization called Liberation Prison Yoga. We're based in New York. I'm originally from Belgium, where I survived child sex trafficking, starting at the age of six. I'm still hearing a lot of noise, I'm yes. sorry. I'm hearing a lot of noise. Yeah. People are talking in the background, but that's like I'm picking up that noise. Sometimes, sometimes. <laughs> sometimes when you flip it has a little more um, volume. volume. <laughs> I know, it's been, I just haven't cut it anymore. I just got, my dog gets the haircuts. <laughs> yeah. Can't afford both. Thank you, Eva. Thank you for taking care of this. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> very. <laughs> Literally. Apologize for that, guys. Let's get a win again. Sorry, I'm this. No, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Ready? I'm, I'm still rolling. Okay. Okay. So let's get a win. Okay. Hopefully, no sound. Rolling fuzzy okay. right there. I mean, it's there. We can't do much about the, some of the sound because they're working in there as well. As long as it's not crazy, as long as it's not, it's not interrupting you, mm. then we stop again. Okay. Okay. But there will be some sound. I can't avoid having, unfortunately, he said. Alrighty. A little sound. Unless, like, if I hear anybody talking, that's really distracting. Okay, great. Yeah. So we stop and then continue. All right. Okay, then. Okay. I'm Annika Lucas. I'm the founder and director of an organization named Liberation Prison Yoga. We bring yoga and meditation into the jails and prisons of New York. And I'm originally from Belgium, where I survived child sex trafficking. I was six years old when it started, and I was rescued at the age of 11. My name is Annika Lucas. I am the founder of an organization in New York called Liberation Prison Yoga. I'm also a survivor of child sex trafficking. I was in a video by Real Women, Real Stories not long ago that traveled all around the world where I shared my story for the first time publicly. I shared about being sold into sex trafficking at the age of six. I shared about rape and torture that I experienced in a pedophile network that was composed largely of VIPs. Since the video has come out, I have read Thousands, well, I've read hundreds of comments. There have been thousands of comments as the video was published and then was picked up by other sites. And I wanted to address some of these comments and something that happened since then. I was also approached by some people who were able to help me identify 
some of the perpetrators. And there's one perpetrator that, like some others, I was able to just type in the country of the person that I knew they were from, which was not in Belgium, politician, and the year. And the person just popped up right, right away. It was amazing. I had no idea that I was dealing with people who were that important. I had no idea that these were people on the world, on the world stage and that they were actually very visible. And I'm quite convinced that if in 1974, when I was released, anyone would have guessed the event of the internet, I'm pretty sure that I would have never made it out alive. I would have never been let go. Now, I can tell you that I went through a process that I've been going through hundreds of times since I've started my healing process over 30 years ago. Just knowing who that person was and seeing pictures of this person, seeing this person on a video, just made the memory that I had of the in incident so vivid and real. And I had to deal once more with the reality of that rape. I was 10 years old, and it was a month before my 11th birthday. I don't know if you know, but as a child, I remember things based on my birthday, because my birthday was important. So it was in March of 1974, and one of the places where I was abused, it was not <clears throat> an orgy where I was sometimes taken and brought in late, and then I was just mingling with the people that were there. No, this was a place, a mansion, where I was taken sometimes, and I would just be, have to go straight to a small room, and in that room there was a dirty mattress, and then I would just be there and wait for the men to come. And in that room, specifically, because it was so abrupt, I was always convinced that the next man who was going to come in was going to say, I'm not going to do this, this is a child. I was 10 years old, and I really didn't look a day older. I was very small. I was completely undeveloped. So I remember this rape particularly well, because I'd actually been protected for about six months. And so I'd gotten used to not being raped. And so I was back in this dirty room and the first man that arrived uh, scared me to death. He looked like a gorilla and he was very gruff and I thought, again, he, oh, he's going to say, this is a child, I'm not going to do this. But instead, he got angry with me and just told me, he didn't tell me, he didn't speak um, my language. He basically motioned for me to take off my clothes. And I remember as I was trying to take off my T-shirt, I got stuck. And so suddenly, I was in this space where I somehow thought I was going to be killed and I couldn't see anything and my arms were stuck and my head was covered and he ripped the shirt off and laughed. And by that time I had gone into what I call my saint personality that I felt guilty that I had been afraid of this man who was just trying to help me. And I tuned in, which is something that I did to survive. I tuned in to the man and I saw in his face, in his lips specifically, something silly. Something that a little silly boy who has been told that he's stupid a lot, 
some boy that was teased, and I saw this silly thing, this vulnerability in this man. And so I honed in on that. And as my sane personality, I loved that boy. And I embraced that boy. And that is how I made the men happy. I gave them something that they, that they needed. They needed to be loved in a way that they hadn't been. And I tuned in to their need and nurtured them. Then I left my body because then he was raping me. I left my body and I went, in this particular case, I went to a lamp that was there and my consciousness was now on the fabric of the lamp which was woven in beige and the light was shining from within and it was as if I could see it better than if I would put my eye right on that lamp. As if my consciousness was out of my body and I didn't feel anything, I was just with that fiber of the lampshade. But then when he was about to have an orgasm, I had to come back in my body because this was always the scariest moment. Because I knew that at any moment those men could decide to kill me and I never knew what, who I really had here. So I had to be very careful. And this man um, looked like he was choking. And I would see in that moment, I would feel the revulsion because he was gone. He was not present at all. And he was having some kind of a release of something. And I was watching it and I was just cold, coldly watching this person this perpetrator having his release that looked insane. Like, I was observing this man's darkest shadow, his darkest moment, and I had no respect for that man. And afterwards, he acted happy he clearly was satisfied and he was trying to speak to me in a foreign language, trying to make conversation with me. Now, I had seen children be murdered and I had heard of a girl being shot for not acting like everything was okay after being raped. And so I took a risk with this man. I stared coldly at him. And I thought, well, he must not be very important because I know he's just kind of silly and he's okay with this. He's not doing anything. He's not gonna do anything to me. So it was a great surprise to find that he was number two in a world power. And I realized that this silliness was so covered over like the emperor's new clothes. The naked emperor and everyone adores the fine thread of the beautiful robes that I still saw this silly thing around this person's mouth, but he was known as the great intellect. Not as visible as the number one in that country in that time, but very high up. So I experienced the process to allow that part that was shut out of my body 
during that rape, to allow that part to integrate again, I, I felt disbelief, shock. I asked myself the same question that many people in their comments asked, how is it possible? Why? Why would this man who has everything on the surface want to engage in these acts? Emotionally, I was in shock and disbelief. And then I went and felt all this anger. I was so furious that someone who does on the surface have everything would allow himself to do this. And I was more aware of myself as just a 10 year old girl because now I could see as an adult woman, this man had raped me. I was just 10 and I know what I looked like. From inside my memory, I was, I had no age, but I just saw myself as this little girl and this man not stopping himself. And I was furious and I got to this place of, I want revenge. I want to kill this man. And he's been dead for more than 10 years, but I wanted to just have that feeling of hurting this man as badly as he had hurt me. And I went through that stage. And I guess I reached a point of acceptance, grief, grief for the girl and feeling the pain of having to go through that. Mm. And then also an understanding, a renewed understanding and expansion of consciousness and increased love for all beings. Because the emotional process, going into trauma, going into our own pain, increases our emotional intelligence, but it also is actually our consciousness. That is what brings us to our own consciousness. So it's interesting that when we are operating in the world, people who know how to manipulate the world can be people who have no insight into their own emotional life at all and can just manipulate the world really well and just stay there and never enter into their trauma at all and just use their brain to manipulate the world and, and get power and ward off their feelings of pain. And then once you start going into the process, things can become very difficult. It can be very difficult to navigate the world. I was just very privileged that I, for a long time, didn't have to physically survive and that I could focus on healing because I would not have done well had I had to also find a job. I needed to, to explore these very dark corners of consciousness, it, it takes a lot out of you. But because I had that privilege, I was able over the course of three decades and with the help of many modalities, not just therapy, but also yoga and meditation and writing. And I was able to, to once again, be able to navigate myself in the world. And, you know, a certain place of healing has to be reached. But this time, I'm navigating the world and I'm coming from this place where I've been through this journey of trauma and I understand things about trauma. And I originally went to serve others who've been traumatized. That's how I ended up going to the prisons because people in jail and prison are vilified from morning to night 
And when I was a little girl, I was vilified from morning to night. I was considered evil, just like prisoners are. So I went back into the prisons and I find people like myself there, people with traumas that are equal in severity, and I'm able to offer something. I'm able to share from my healing and this heart-to-heart -heart connection that I can make with people who are deeply traumatized and are being even traumatized in the moment is the most beautiful thing in the world. But I also develop programs based on my healing that others could bring into the prisons and the jails. So, and I train other people to go into the prisons and the jails. And I train people about trauma, working with traumatized populations. And of course, I now also uh, lead my own organization. And so I raise funds and I'm dealing with people all day long. I'm navigating the world, but in a way that comes from a place of empathy and compassion. And my personal challenge is to find understanding for those perpetrators, the worst evildoers in the world. You know, to think of evil, there's hurting children, which is horrific. Then there's raping children. Then there's killing children. And then it is that it is committed by people who have a social responsibility, who have a responsibility to the masses, who all of us have invested in, have given our power to them through a vote, and who are responsible for our well-being. I know that it's easy to, to say, well, politicians are all corrupt. But then it's a little bit harder to think that a politician who's corrupt also rapes and kills children. I think that's where we have to draw the line. We say, no, that I can't believe. Because if they're doing that, I think everyone has to go through the process that I just described because it's personal. It's, per it's a personal betrayal for everyone. If that's what our world leaders are doing, well, it's really no wonder that the world looks like what it looks like today. It's no wonder that there is so much hunger and poverty in the, poverty in the world, and that the resources of the world are being hoarded by a few. It's no wonder. But that this is an addiction, that this is an addiction that any junkie that you find on the street that has to shoot up and will do anything to get that next high, that these people are no better. These people have an amazing brain and intellect, and it makes them all the more dangerous to the world. That is an addiction to power. It's an addiction that I know everything about because I was really badly abused. I know what it's like to feel silly and to be laughed at. So I can relate. I can relate to the need to cover over this lack of self-esteem with something from the outside, some status, something that I can that gives me importance from the outside, sometimes that, something that gives me that, that robe, that invisible robe of power, that everyone is just going to look up to me. I, I wish, you know, sometimes I wish, it seems like the easy way out. On a personal level though, I had to reach a place in my healing where I understand that, that I would never want that. I never chose for it and that's why I went into the healing, which is away from power towards truth. And unfortunately, we're always going in one direction or the other direction. There's kind of no place in between. We're either doing the right thing or we're doing something that goes against the good of ourself and the good of others. But someone who's that far gone in their addiction 
has no sense of morality left. It's all gone. And we, people with a sense of morality, want to believe that those people are like us. But they're not. They are not. Brain-wise, those are people who are like lizards. With the actual, what is called, the, the brain is called that, that, that's the reptilian brain. They're lizards with like a big uh, cortex over it. And the emotional brain is completely non-functioning. This has been shown in MRIs and fMRIs that were done with psychopaths. So that's what we have. That's the world leaders. That's what we are dealing with every day. And every one of us is somehow a little bit a victim of that. And it's the degree to which a person is in touch with their own trauma and their own pain that will dictate from which place a person is going to respond to this dark truth. So when my video started to travel the world, I thought, well, the time has come because a lot of people responded from the highest place, from empathy, uh, from understanding the need for this darkness to be revealed, to change, for the world to change, and for, every, for anything to change at all in the world. So there was a lot of very deep understanding. Um, there were a lot of people who were very empathic, who clearly have had that journey, have been through that journey, have dealt with trauma, ha are able to feel things, and are, um, are empathic and are able to know that this is real. Even though they may have had to go through the same kind of process just watching my video and being confronted with this dark truth. And then a lot of people wanted me to name names. And that's, you know, it's like, it's easy to say, but um, anyone who really knows the world of power would not advise me to name names because um, I don't want to compromise myself uh, in any way. I don't want to be open myself up to litigation from the families. And I should say that all my perpetrators are dead. Um, and that my naming names today wouldn't make any difference. It wouldn't save a single child. It's a noble idea to name names to save children, but my safety has to come first because I have to do my work. I cannot compromise my safety. That would not be wise. But wanting to name names, wanting me to name names from people that you know I saw in Belgium in 1972, um, there is that natural feeling of revenge that I was talking about. Right? Revenge, the desire for revenge when confronted with this darkness and this horror. Of course we want revenge. Of course we want to do something. We want to take some action before really accepting that this is the truth. This is the status quo right now. It is part of the process and it reflects where a person is in their process to want revenge, to be in this place of anger. It's a good place to be. It's very important to feel our anger, you know? If you don't, if you, all the anger is repressed, that's where all the problems start. So it's a good thing to honor the anger. It's a good thing to know that we are angry. I teach that in prison very much because prisoners are told all day long that they are evil for being angry. And that's what I was told too. But in a situation of abuse, anger is the first natural response to injustice. So, and it unfortunately reflects to the perpetrator that they are doing something wrong. And so it is squelched with fear. And so that person is, who is being abused is not going to be allowed to express anger. And so anger is a very necessary feeling that is a very valid part of the healing process. And then yet still other people 
we're in this place of disbelief and shock. Like, nope, can't believe it. This isn't real. Or, oh my God, this is so unbelievable. The first entry into the process, the emotional process that each one of us needs to pass through in order to really accept that these things are happening and in order to be able to be in reality so that we can make a change, so that we can be empowered ourselves and not give our power away to people who are just going to steal it and then rape children, among other things. So, the last group of people in the comments, in the responses, was the group, the relatively small group, those that attacked me. Oh, she's great. That was, usually is not direct to me. No, it was not direct. A lot of empathic comments were directed direct to me, whereas a lot of the attacks were directed in the, to the third person. She is lying. Um, Someone said, I'm crazy. So, you know, you can say that, sure. You know, it's whatever you can handle. You can't handle any of this truth, then I'm going to be crazy. Although, you're not gonna get very far calling me crazy because I'm a person in the world and it's just not very believable. It makes you look crazy, but this stage before entering any kind of process, any kind of emotional process, those are the people who attack. Go on the attack, be the bully. Just tell that person that, just turn it around. You know, say that I'm the perpetrator. Just say that I'm bad, I'm evil. I'm evil for spreading the news. That's the people who are not able to have any kind of their own are not able to access their own emotional reality, their own pain. And it's those people who are the most likely to be in that category of um, abusers and power addicts. And, and a lot of people in that category are just very afraid and want to belong to the power. So we need to look at our internal power dynamics. If I look up to someone, I look up at them because I see in them a power figure from my childhood, someone who I thought was good. And if I look down at someone and I judge someone and I just like think they're not even quite human, I'm actually looking at the child that I was and that was being abused and was made to feel that way and that I don't want to be reminded. I don't want to be reminded of being made to feel that way. I want to continue to make my abusers good, and I want to continue to make the unloved child just make them disappear. So, there's a lot of work to be done. We're just at the very beginning of this change. It's the very beginning where people are really understanding that this darkness, it's, it's really here. You know, there's so much hypocrisy, so, much, so many lies. And what lies behind that hypocrisy and those lies, that's what we're just starting to look at. That's the people we've given our power to. But it's exactly this process of feeling pain and having the courage to go into the most painful moments of our lives and to feel again how vulnerable we were and to feel again the fear that we're going to be abused in that moment, that that is going to be used against us and then find compassion, love, understanding. If I had not been healed before I would have spoken out about these truths, um, let's say that I was in a place, for example, where I needed love 
because obviously I wasn't very loved as a child and I still needed love and I was hoping, secretly hoping that by sharing my story, the public, the strangers were going to come and love me and they were going to confirm everything for me and I was going to receive that love that I'd never felt. If I had done that, well, it would have backfired, but also that's exactly what power addicts do. To receive love in this way that it's not real. You know, people just respond from wherever they are at. And I knew, I knew that if I was going to be attached to the outcome, then I was also going to be very hurt by those people who were going to attack me. And I wasn't going to be ready emotionally to deal with it. So it's why I waited so long to speak. <laughs> Just I'm take a break. <laughs> I think that's all I have to say. But I'm going to use the bathroom.